Where Welcome you- back to the Ford Book Club, and uh, we are now in the year 2020, and we hope our vision will be 2020 during this year, seeing things very clearly. We're continuing with this extraordinary book, The Day is Now Far Spent by Robert Carlos Seurat, and we've been t- taking a lot of time with this book. But I I think this book is going to be a kind of a milestone or a touchstone for for some time to come because he's so clear-sighted in foreseeing the situation and then discerning the spirits in a Christian way. I just, there's so much in here. So my recollection is, and of course my recollections are, uh, oh, by the way, we have David Deuter with us, as usual, in San Francisco, Joseph Pierce in South Carolina, uh, and uh, we're back to continue. And who are you? Oh, I'm Father Joseph Fessio, SJ, that's true. I'm not a household word just yet. <laughs> just yet, or ever will be. But So we are actually on part three of this book, which is titled, The Fall of Truth, Moral Decadence, and bad political habits. I think it's the longest section in the book, and you can understand why, because he's kind of describing uh, the evils and the problems that he sees. And we are, actually, we finished Chapter 7 last session, Where is the World Headed? And now it's called Hatred, Ridicule, and Cynicism. And I have uh, not as many Passages I want to quote, but they're a lot longer. Uh, but so let's just see what happens. And you people interrupt me or tell me to stop or whatever you want to do. But uh, I have something that begins on page 214. Uh, Joseph? That, that beats me on 217. Really? Okay, yeah. well, uh, he says at the bottom paragraph on page 214, In the 21st century, totalitarianism has a more pernicious face. Huh. The 20th century was pretty pernicious when you had fascism, communism, uh, and Nazism. Its name is the idolatry of complete and absolute freedom, which is manifested in its most aggressive forms in gender ideology and transhumanism. We have to unpack that, we will. But continuing this paragraph, Nazism, fascism, and communism have terrible successors. We were talking about new ideologies that deny human dignity and promote abortion and euthanasia, but also about Islamist fanaticism, which kills to establish a reign of terror. Some clues allow us to discern the same demonic origins of these movements. We see in them one of the same hatred of man, one of the same destructive pride. So it's interesting. He's talking about the West's materialism and individualism and Islam's fanaticism. And he calls them both of demonic origin. I mean, that's you know, what I think is very interesting in that passage, Father, is he actually refers to this new totalitarianism the um, of gender ideology, uh, idolatry of complete and absolute freedom, as successors of uh, Nazism, fascism, and communism. Now, that will raise eyebrows, certainly from people that uh, um, are part of the, the pride movement, but we we really need to remember that all of those movements were actually rooted in pride, theologically understood, um, about putting yourself first, about being selfish, um, and about and about basically not treating human beings with dignity. Abortion and euthanasia were widely practiced under the communists, under the fascists, and under the Nazis. Uh, and there's a sort of um, a rooted Nietzscheanism in all of those ideologies. Um, the self-deification of man uh, and the uh, the triumph of the rights of the strong to, to empower them to impose their will upon those that are weaker. Right. I think, uh, selecting a few words out of what you just said, the triumph of will. 
Uh, even such a thing as the so-called pro-choice movement. What does that mean? A choice is good or bad determined by its object, not by the fact that you make it. Right. The triumph of will is to say, oh no, as long as I choose it, it's a good thing. It's the best yes. thing for me. Right, and of course, the, 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 as I'm sure that the, uh, our our viewers know, that the uh, the famous um, uh, propaganda film of the Nazis was the triumph of the will. Yes, and uh, by the way, Joseph, uh, we have Vivian at a disadvantage today. She had a fever 102 yesterday, and she's not quite recovered. So let's take advantage of her weakness if we can. <laughs> Yeah. Vivian, you look amazingly good in that case. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just went to bed and stayed there as long as possible. Oh, good yeah, for you. I mean, <clears throat> we already have two to one against her, but, yeah. you know, in, in our very binary thinking, you know, yeah. male and female. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, well, then for his next paragraph, which is on page 250, he says, considering the current historical context, it is urgent for the church through the voice of her leaders, to make known to everyone definitively the Creator's will concerning man, the family, marriage, the sacredness and respect for the human person. How many persons of goodwill would join in with such a splendid act of courage by the church? So he's calling on others, including himself, to speak out boldly and bravely and clearly. Okay. And I do think in terms of evangelization of the culture, um, if the church were to speak with, with courage and act with courage and face the consequences of such courage, I think it would be a great witness. And we would actually see many people that are floundering in the culture of death turn into the church as the lifeboat. Uh, but when it sees the church you know, herself sort of hesitating uh, in some sort of um, less than courageous way in the face of the zeitgeist, it's actually compromising the church's ability to evangelize. Well, I want to make a little local uh, statement here because we're speaking from San Francisco and uh, we're blessed with our church leaders. We have Archbishop Cordelione in San Francisco who on these very issues has spoken up very clearly, very boldly and very bravely. We have Bishop Barber, former Jesuit, is still a Jesuit, I suppose, uh, in Oakland, who is a Marine chaplain, likewise clear and strong. And then up north of us in Santa Rosa, where Ignatius Press has its retreat house, Bishop Robert Vasha, who again is just a manly, strong, loving, articulate, orthodox bishop. So there's others in the country. We're not alone in this, but it's a great blessing for us to be here in the San Francisco Bay, which in a certain sense is the heart of the beast. Right. We got Silicon Valley here, and those people are trying to change, you know, man's, I won't say his, it can't change his nature, but change who he is. And we got San Francisco, which is a locus of every kooky idea that you can imagine. And yet we have really strong strong church leaders. Well, as proof that there are people of goodwill who would join if the churches and their leadership, and of course, the people have to be behind their leaders. I mean, one thing that makes bishops cowardly is when they don't think anyone is following with them. Uh, mm -hmm. They're all alone and they get torn to bits and that definitely has an enervating effect. But as proof that people of goodwill would follow a clear voice. Just before Christmas, we had a visit from uh, a second cousin of my husband who's married to a pharmaceutical uh, executive from a very, very big company, international company. And uh, he started talking about genetics. And by the way, down here on 215, where... Cardinal Sirach is speaking further about science and technology being the instruments of this new uh, totalitarianism and genetics being the new god. So this here's this 
high, high executive in an international pharmaceutical company sitting at my table and saying, what's going on in genetic research? I mean, there's just so many potentially terrible things. Where is the church? That's what he said. Where is the church? I don't hear, here they're picking about, I don't even know what. The church needs to get on these topics and start saying something that, that, that the rest of us can hear. And I just was sort of taken aback. I felt almost like a little bit of a chastised, but not that we aren't doing our part in, in well, being that church Well, did you give a copy speaks. of this book? I mean, you should have given a copy of this book. You're That's right. where the church is. Yeah, I should mail it to him, actually. Yeah, because That's a good idea, Father. I'm going to mail uh, The Day is Now Far Spent to this fellow because he was really he really wanted to engage in this discussion. He wanted to talk about the ethics of, the, of this new research and so on. And so there are people out there, intelligent people and, and, and powerful people. Well, let me, I want to put a plug in for what we're doing in Nature's Press at Forum, that this book club, I mean, let's face it, the major media, by and large, are going to screen out any church defense of human nature. Was that? I don't know. Okay. Outer space checking in. And so, uh, but by podcasts, you know, by form, by Ignatius Press, what we're doing, by publishing these books, we are trying to penetrate that shield, which yeah. the humanistic culture is putting up, the anti-humanistic culture is putting up, so the church will not be heard. I mean, what are, I mean, if you ask people, what's your, what news about the church have you heard recently? Right. Sex abuse crisis. That's right. You know, that's that's they all they about, hear. Which is bad enough. But it also undermines the church's authority, you know, precisely in the area of sexual morality, where she's the one organization in the world standing out uh, consistently to defend these natural rights. Right. Well, I mean, I'm going to, I also had that paragraph you mentioned, Vivian, but even next, it's the paragraph on 215 volume. I'm not going to read the whole chapter in the whole book, but I mean, uh, he says, continuing here, the atheistic theology, ideology in the 20th century intended to detach man from God. Okay, that's what the atheists tried to do. The new ideologies now hope to mutilate and control his nature. Man dreamed up his own earthly paradise. It was a bitter failure. Now he wants to change his own human nature. Notice what he's saying here. With totalitarianism, they had this idea about a new paradise they're going to bring. No, it didn't work. Now they're trying to change the individual nature of persons. John Paul II fought with all his might in favor of the fall of communism. The church must now protect the weakest persons from the madness of transhumanism and from gender ideology, with which the capitalist and liberal forces seem to be perfectly satisfied. So, again, he's making this parallel between the old totalitarianism and the new. Right. <clears throat> now, I would say that the old totalitarianisms also had as their end the transformation of man, but they thought that that would come about through the transformation of society, you know, the elimination of property, the elimination of, uh, of uh, hierarchy and, and so on. Um, that's what was proved to be a failure, that by changing the external... Mac machinery of society that you would change mankind. Yeah, but the now, other thing to say though, that's true, Vivian, of, of, of the Marxists, of the communists. Yes, that's exactly right. And so yeah. what I'm saying is that the new, this new totalitarianism is now saying the way we're going to change man is by changing the human person himself. And, but, and, yeah. the, and the reason why these capitalist and liberal forces are satisfied with this movement is because they're making big money off of to take take gender transformation. It's an industry now. You've got doctors and lawyers and pharmaceutical companies and clinics and therapists and there's an entire industry now around this thing. And they're now a vested interest making use of the machinery both of liberal democracy and liberal capitalism to push this thing forward. And not to mention the, the, the worship of absolute freedom. I, I have absolute freedom and absolute choice over making myself into anything. 
and you're here to help me and make money off my desire to do this. You can see how it just goes together hand in glove, right? Yeah, the, the, the two things, I, I, I agree with everything you've said. I'm not disagreeing, but I want to add to it that we should remember that the, although the Marxists believe that you could change human nature by changing uh, basically the economic and social structure of society, mm -hmm. the Nazis believed you could change society through eugenics. In other mm -hmm. words, through the use of genetics. Uh, and that, in, in that sense, this, this new gender ideology is actually much closer to the Nazis. The Nazis believed in genetic modification. They practiced it. They forcibly sterilized the unfit. And they forcibly sterilized the mentally disabled so that they could not um, reproduce. And now we have the mentally disabled being exterminated in the womb so that they're not part of, of society. So there's actually something perniciously close yes. to Nazism in these people. It doesn't matter to what extent they, they may be horrified by the fact that the practice is the same. You're right. You're right. And in a way, Joseph, that really never went away, right? Because as soon as abortion became a widespread practice, uh, it was, of course, used uh, to eliminate the unwanted. I mean, in fact, when they were first arguing for the uh, legality of abortion, the very hard cases that they were putting before the public and the press and so on often had to do, well, what about the woman who got German measles while she was pregnant? You know, you're going to force her to carry a term, a potentially defective child. I mean, this was the specter that they put before people. So that eugenic impetus never went away, even right. though we think we defeated Nazism and this horrid mentality. No, it never was defeated. Uh, Margaret Sanger um, published Nazis in her journal. Uh, members of the organization that became Planned Parenthood visited Nazi Germany and wrote glowing uh, reports about how they were um, humanely aborting subhumans, you know, the, the mentally disabled children, and, and the, the Planned Parenthood people in this country were applauding what the Nazis were doing. There is a real connection here. Yes, there is. And now with uh, genetic manipulations of uh, in vitro fertilized offspring, this is just eugenics taken to the next step, right? That you're going to yep. be able to create human beings outside the womb, manipulate them genetically, and now only give birth to these ideal people. And this is big money right now. People working on these technologies, people more than happy to benefit from them. Yeah. Well, I want to jump ahead and hook onto what you said previously about freedom to do whatever you want, but that, that seems to be the driving force in the West. And uh, on page 230, uh, he says, there's two paragraphs in the middle. It's the second one that particularly refers to what you had uh, said, Vivian. Modern man wants nothing more to do with his creator, and so he tramples the moral laws little by little, only to replace them with the so-called democratic rules of law. The most rudimentary desires become the measuring measure of everything. The majority, often represented by the parliamentary power of the states and manipulated by the powerful media, little by little rewrites the moral norm. And now here comes a paragraph that really connects what you said. In this wayward development, individual freedom is the only criterion and personal satisfaction the only objective. Everyone can do what he wants. The moral law is detested. The media high priests burn incense to impulses. And here's the examples. If a man wants to put an end to his life, he can. If a man wants to become a woman, he can. If a girl wants to prostitute herself on the internet, she can. If an adolescent wants to look at pornography on the internet, he can. If a woman wants to board a child, she can. It is her right. Everything is possible. And then beginning the next paragraph, this picture may appear to be a caricature, and yet this is the reality. Here's a great sentence. We have entered into a civilization of the chaos of desires. A civilization of the chaos of desires. Right. So back to what we said earlier about the will to power, the will to self. I mean, what do you want? What do you want? What do you, what's your will to do? Well, what makes what gives you pleasure? Your desire. Right, right. I mean, that's and now the forces of, of, of 
liberal capitalism and liberal democracy are here more than happy to satisfy your every desire and to even come up with other desires you might not even have thought of yet and sell those to you as well. well advertise it. Right. And so you can see how these things are all going together. What? Yeah, I guess we need to remind ourselves, of course, that this, uh, both on the microcosmic and the macrocosmic level, yeah. is unsustainable. In other words, you know, if I as an individual decide I'm going to do exactly what I like in a completely self-gratifying way, I'm going to ruin my life and in the process ruin the lives of others. Yes. If that's true of an individual, it's obviously true ma manifold uh, if you're talking about society as a whole. Yes. So what we're living in this chaos, I, mean, I also highlighted that sentence, Bob, about the... Uh, civilization of the chaos of desires, you know, I'm always reminded of those words, I, you've probably heard me quote several times before, because I come back to them, of Oscar Wilde, that uh, anarchy is freedom's own Judas, that what we're actually doing is betraying and ultimately destroying authentic freedom yes. in the pursuit of this chaos. That's right. And, you know, as Aristotle pointed out, Happiness requires virtue. And so any society that loses its way on the moral plane, there's no government that can fix this. There's no, there's no program that's going to fix this. You know, later on, the cardinal says he doesn't have a program. <laughs> I thought that was so funny because after all of this, you know, criticism and, and, and evaluation, and looking so terrible, he basically says, I don't have a program to fix this. You know, well, not a program, but he has a solution. Yeah. So but but the point is, is that people look to often in situations of this chaos, they look to some one thing that's going to just fix it. Some one regime, some what this is why demagogues come to power. Right. Because they make promises right. that they are going to fix whatever it is. And, and people are so ready for somebody to come and fix it. And so we really have to resist those other impulses to think that it's just going to be one, I don't know, system or person or government or something that's just going to fix all this. No, without virtue, there's no possibility of happiness. And for Aristotle, virtue meant habitually doing the good. Yes. And the good was acting in accordance with your nature. Yes, so that's if, right. So if you don't accept the fact that there is a nature given men by God, that's right. then you don't have a criterion for what is virtuous and what is not. That's I mean, right. That's, yeah. that's right. And I think that Carl does talk about the need for natural law to be the, the ballast in the ship here. And, uh, and yet again, how is that going to be applied? We can't expect some ruler to just impose it, we've got to somehow rediscover this tradition that we have, this very rich political, philosophical, theological tradition, and start living it in our lives. Okay, I want to go back to page 215. We're going to get to your 217 pretty soon, Joseph, but that's a paragraph that Vivian already referred to at the very bottom of the page. I want to read it for the, for the sake of the last sentence, the second last sentence, which again is, I mean, He's got some of these sentences which ought to be chiseled in stone uh, over a lot of buildings. He says, man, willingly deprived of God, it's not like God was taken away from us, we, we rejected God, seeks to transform his body. Science and the new technologies are the instruments of this contemporary demiurgic enterprise. Man and nature must bow under the relentless slope of research. The promise is simple. Augmented man will become immortal. We have cryogenics now to try and preserve people until we can make, keep them alive forever. What a horrible thought. His intellectual ability will be unequal. We're going to implant, you know, you know, Chips devices, uh, you know, computers. And his physical forces will be increased tenfold. They've already got these exoskeletal things you can get into which allow you to pick up trucks. Genetics is the new God. No one knows in what disasters it will end. And nevertheless, we continue on this foolhardy course. Is the catastrophe imminent? The answer of the mad ideologues is invariably simple. It is necessary to carry on with the forced march. We will pay dearly for this senseless process of self-destruction. Here's the sentence I really like. Augmented man 
will ultimately be diminished man. The monstrous path will lead to the commercialization of man as a commodity. Augmented man will ultimately be diminished man. Yep. <clears throat> yep. And there are this, okay, uh, necessary to carry on with this forced march. march. So what, what are the forces that make this seem like we can't stop it? So there's a, there's a genetic scientist at UC Berkeley. I can't remember her name right now. And she was saying we absolutely have to stop some of this stuff before it goes too far. And, but the argument against this, oh, but if we stop, China won't. we got to keep up with China. You know, we, th there's this idea that, well, even if we think this is morally reprehensible, we somehow just have to keep doing it because if we don't do it, somebody else will. And so how you get off of this, you know, rat wheel, I, I don't know. No, but you become a beacon of virtue. I mean, this is the paradox that, you know, if, for instance, the United States were to decide to actually practice virtue rather than um, uh, real politic on the international stage uh, in a sort of neoconservative sense, um, people would look to America as something that want, that's worth emulating. People would like would want to be like uh, America. Whereas if you go, if you try to outdo everybody else in the, in the race towards hell, yeah. you know, you're just going to be seen as the worst perpetrator of the hellish. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a question basically of a radical rethink of what it means to be patriotic, what it means to be a nation. Um, and it is it's connected to good old fashioned Christian virtue. And, and, and it would actually work because, again, microcosmic, macrocosmic, the saint is attractive. Right to the sinner, the sinner sees the saint and says, "Well, I'm not like that person, but I I wish I were." Right, and the same thing applies on the macro level. If people see virtue rather than vice, they're attracted to it. But it's the whole idea of we have to be sort of about politics and power, um, and and outbidding and outracing the other person. Mm -hmm. um, I think is it is madness, and it's seen as madness. Mm -hmm. Joseph, uh, you have something on page 217? Uh, yeah, um, just a little brief snippet here towards the top. Um, and this, it, it, it dovetails with what we've been talking about. So the end of the, the, the top paragraph there, um, prophet is the only god of the globalized elites who care nothing about man's future. And I think one of the problems here is the actual mechanism of global corporatism uh, is all about profit and profit as measured in the current fiscal year or at most you know the next two or three or four fiscal years in other words there's no concept of the future in terms of what makes uh, a, a global corporation successful uh, there's a myopia mechanistically built into things and that's the problem because people are following uh, the gratification of the immediate future and not the wisdom of what the consequences of that gratification will be. Joseph, you're way behind the times and too optimistic. It's not the next fiscal year that counts. It's the next quarter. You have <laughs> yeah, quarterly well, reports and you must, you must show a progress from quarter to quarter. They can't wait for a whole year. That's right. And it's because of the, uh, it's because of the stock market that, uh, share, you know, the value of those shares is going to go up based on those quarterly report, go up or down based on those quarterly reports and the money that's in this huge investment pool, which, by the way, includes all of these pension funds, whether you're a government pension fund oh, or yeah. a private pension Going fund, everyone's retirement, everyone's, everyone is wrapped up in this thing. And, and if, 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 Profits are showing to go down in a quarterly report. Then the values of those shares go down. Then then people rapidly are selling those and buying this, and and now uh, you know the the value of these things is precisely in their ability to go up rapidly so that you can sell them and make your money that way. Whether the company even has any real value has become somewhat immaterial. Well, so, again, again, you know, Oscar Wilde, God bless him. A uh, cynic is one who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. We, li we live in the mercy of a cynical machine. It's not even a cynical human being. It's, it's a mechanism which is beyond everybody's control, which is rooted in cynicism. Well, look, at how, much of the, look how much of the trading is based on an algorithm. In other words, 
these uh, purchases and sales are occurring almost automatically based on these programs that they put in place to be measuring these things on a minute by minute basis, on well, a second minute by, by second. Minute. It's, it's a fraction of a second. See? And in fact, there's a firm on Long Island, I think it's Long Island, called Renaissance. They're, they're the most successful hedge fund in the last 10 years, over 40% profit every year. And they will not hire anybody that knows anything about any business. Yeah. No, <laughs> they, 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 they will only hire mathematicians. Right. And they've got these algorithms, and they're, they're just basically looking yeah. at these trends, and they're making transactions in the thousands of a second. I believe it. You know? And this is what's driving this whole thing. And we we are all part of it. You know, they're caught up in it, yeah. And and well, well Joseph, all Joseph stocks, he, he he's buying and selling every minute, I know. Exactly. I I, I don't know have time for this because I spend most of my time on the computer buying. Oh, stuff. One thing I want to say, uh Vivian <laughs> and Glenn Dude have a very beautiful daughter, Mary, who married a very brilliant young man, Tom. Uh, who was a graduate of Notre Dame in philosophy and in uh, uh, economics, I think. Finance. Finance. And uh, when I got to know Tom, I asked him this question. I said, Tom, what is the most important task of a CEO? And he said, as I expected, increasing shareholder value. Yep. And I said, that is wrong. That's and actually... He's changed his view on that because of a professor at Notre Dame who he talked to me about, who was at the wedding. There's a wonderful oh, professor. Oh, yes. Wonderful professor from um, Holland, yeah. Denmark or whatever. And he now is, uh, I think he might be a chair now of a department at Notre Dame. But his, his point in my point was the purpose of a chief executive offer, officer is to provide a valuable product or service that will help people live better lives uh, in a way that, employs people that can support themselves and their families in a decent way. That's what a CEO does, not increase shareholder value. Right. And so yeah. now that, that because, you know, because that's such a harder thing to evaluate these, these more qualitative assessments yes. of, of, of a yeah, person's yeah. life and all that, you know, it's so much easier to latch on to a numerical value, a, a number, a, 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 a dollar data point. Yeah. And be able to just kind of base everything on that. You can see why this happens. I mean, we have but, to, but also, we have but also, also, Vivian, the other problem is the mania in the mid 20th century to make everything a, a physical science. Yes. So economics, yes. which is really one of the humanities. What is economics? It's about the management of the human, you know, the human household on a micro and macro level. That's right. Um, that it's, a, it's part of the humanities. It's about humanity. It's about human beings, human persons, and the dignity of the human person. Whereas when they make it econometric, when it's all about, you know, pure data and try to turn it into a hard science, they actually kill it. And that's, that's what's right. happened. They've actually killed economics. I know. I you know, that's what I studied at the university. Yes. And when I was encouraged to go on for my master's degree, and I went to a professor, a mentor, to talk about what programs I should apply to and whatever, and he was saying, look, this is all about quantitative science now. You've got to get your math up, and you got it. And I said, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I ended up not doing that, but I know exactly what you're talking about. That's exactly what economics has become. I have one yeah. short That's quote now problem. from the end of this chapter, page 218, and we can probably call it a quits for, for the day. Uh, and it's not directly on what the rest of the chapter is, but it struck me. Uh, Carl Seurat says, I observe, however, that church no longer devotes homilies to the soul eternity, and the last things. Priests are afraid of provoking mockery. But here's a sense I like. During funeral ceremonies, the suppression of the Dies Irae is symbolic of this false modesty. I'm glad someone finally spoke up about the most beautiful, one of the four most beautiful sequences in the church, the Dies Irae, which I put in my little, I don't have a will, but the Jesuits asked us to give a little recommendation for a funeral. And I said, I want the Dies Irae song. Anyway, and sing it like you mean it. Yeah. <laughs> any any closing thoughts, Joseph or Vivian? Uh, well, no. Only that it's a it's a blessing to be spending time on this wonderful and prophetic volume with uh, with the two of you. It's a joy. Amen. <laughs> well, we will see you all next week. God bless you all, and thanks for.